Wow. Everybody, welcome to the last part of our Veterans Week. Um, this is our last official panel from uh, my office. Um, we will be talking about military families and the um, the hurdles and the special challenges and kind of the emotional part of being a military family member and all that means. Um, it's always available for Q&A down at the bottom um, to ask questions of our panelists and we'll try to answer them. Um, to start us off, my name is Phil Larson. I coordinate Veteran and Military Services at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. We are very happy to have you here today as we conclude our Veterans Week. And so happy Friday for everybody watching out there. Um, so I'll have our panelists. This is an interesting camera. It swivels as we go around and kind of, and uh, there might be two cameras at one point in time, but uh, we'll have our panelists start introducing themselves. So who wants, to, uh, let's go by order um, on the screen. And so uh, first we have Tia. Uh, yes, hi, I'm Tia Dai, and I've been a military spouse for over 20 years. Um, I live here in Ann Arbor and with our kids. The longest we've lived anywhere, we're here over three years now. It's the first time we've lived somewhere longer than three years. So that's our new adventure currently. Nice. Thank you for being here today. Next, we have Ronald. <laughs> um, hi, um, right there, uh, Ricky. It, it, as is common, it is misspelled. I put it oh, using okay. more misspelled than it's spelled correctly for six letters. Um, and I was in the Navy where I worked really closely with the Marines. And then after that, I joined again. And I was in the Air Force where I did not work really closely with the Army. And um, so I'm at the MSW program here with the Intense is trying to work on um, some of the accounts that we're working with this in the future. Thank you very much. And next we have Andrew. Hello, I'm uh, Andrew DeVries. I'm currently a student here at the University of Michigan. Um, I'm originally from uh, upstate New York, and uh, my dad is in the Navy, and um, he's been in the Navy my whole life, I guess. He retired. Uh, around 2011 uh, from the reserve. So um, we moved around a lot. My family did uh, before I was born, but uh, once once I was born, it was, um, you know, he did, he did get recalled back to duty once or twice. But uh, yeah, so I, I've, uh, I'm here for, for my dad, I guess. <laughs> All right. And uh, Noah uh, sends a shout out to you, by the way, in chat. So, Jalen? Um, okay, I'm Jalen. I'm in the Army, but my dad is in the Air Force, so I was. So, everyone always makes a joke about that. But, um, yeah, he was in the, he went to the Air Force Academy and then joined active duty after that. And um, I'm a 16 pilot for the majority of my childhood and got out of active duty a little over 10 years ago and then was at the Garden Theater for a while. And uh, he just finished. Like completely retired a couple of weeks ago. And next, oh, uh, oh, next, Robert. Uh, is it Robert? Yes. You want me to go again? Huh? You want me to go again? Oh, I'm sorry. Did everybody go? I apologize. Yeah, I'm trying to get the video. Right. Sorry about that. Last okay. name is misspelled, and now you changed my name. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. To clarify, because I know I think I'm a different person. My uh, name is Ron. Sorry about that. I'm, they got me working with an, an Apple and I've, I've been doing with a PC all week. So I'm trying to figure out how to cast this right. So my apologies. Um, so one of the things we um, we wanted to talk about just military families on the panel and, um, you know, your family, um, you know, your kids, if you have them. I mean, you can talk about the whole family experience. So it's not just limited to, to like your views. You can you can talk about how it affects all your family. And even the service member um, as we talk and go through it. So that's fine too. So it's kind of all this kind of mix of, of what it means to your kind of the larger family construct, right? Um, and you can answer as we as we go through the panel. Um, you can tell I, I love it when we talk amongst each other. So this can be a kind of a discussion amongst you. And we just kind of listen in. So if you jump, you know, if you something kind of strikes you and you want to talk about that, um, this isn't just a you know, I ask a question, you answer it. I ask a question, you answer it. This is really a conversation. Um, and even with our folks online, 
hopefully they ask some questions and tend to the folks who are doing the webinar. Um, and when they, uh, you know, they'll ask questions and I'll ask them of you too, and then you can answer them. Cool? That works? All right. So kind of our first question that we have written down that you guys already got, um, kind of describe a bit of your, about your military family background. Kind of think about how long you're, um, you've been in the, you know, you've been in the service, how many times you've moved, any deployments, temporary duty assignments, you know, times in which your families were separated. So kind of think about, give us a little bit of background of this kind of process, if you don't want. And anybody can say, we don't have to go in order. I'll start. Um, so I was, this might be a little long-winded, so I'll try to keep it. <laughs> so when uh, my husband and I were dating before we were married, he was gone for a year unexpectedly. He went off for training to Iraq and then stayed for a year. Um, and then we, when he returned, uh, we got married. And then two weeks, uh, I mean, some time went by. <laughs> We met in Germany, and then we moved to Georgia after we got married. Then we moved to upstate New York, where we had both of our kids. He was gone. We were there for three years. One of those years, um, he was gone, which was uh, right after my son was born. Um, and he was, that was a 16-month deployment because of an extension. And then uh, we moved to Kansas for three years, where he was TDY. Pretty much two months of every uh, two weeks of every month, so um, that's a totally different and almost more challenging than a deployment in a lot of ways. Um, then followed that up with another twelve month deployment. Um, then moved to Alaska and <laughs> unexpectedly for two years. Um, back to Kansas for one year. Um, which is a challenge for at that age for the kids for school age. Then up to Washington State for three years, of which one year um, he was deployed, and the rest, the first year he was again gone um, too much of the month on and off. Um, and then to here, <laughs> where we are here longer than three years, which is um, new and refreshing. And um, and he's been home a lot, so we've spent a lot of our our time moving as uh, eight moves, seven states, um, four deployments, four three twelve months, and one sixteen month deployment, and um, and multiple PDYs. So um, it's been an adventure. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Down. We'll get back to those. We'll get back to talking about that too. Yeah. Right? But how about anybody else? What's been your experience as far as like the news and that? Do you want to? Sure. Um, so I'm uh, the oldest in my family. Actually, I have five other kids. So um, I don't know. I kind of categorize the move by which kid was born. So um, when I was, I was born in Texas. We were stationed there for a minute and then. My dad got stationed, or he had to go to Korea for like a year. My mom and I went home and stayed with my grandpa for, for a while. And then we ended up moving to Phoenix for probably a year or two. And then we moved to Italy, and my sister was born. We were there for three years. Um, and I started school there. And then um, we were home on, on break. My other sister was born. And then we went back to Italy. My brother was born. And then we. <laughs> We moved to um, Utah and we were there for a few, I think probably four or five years maybe. We were there for a little while actually. Um, and throughout all this, my dad was like deployed. He was deployed a lot when we were um, in Italy. Uh, and then when we were in Utah, he was deployed to Iraq for like nine months. Now in Utah because all the, the younger kids were like, you know, I was probably eight. So the other, ones, the other ones were like, you know, like seven, six, five. Um, and my mom was also teaching for a while at the time. Um, so then we moved. My dad got out of active duty after Utah and we moved back to Ohio, which is where my parents were originally from. And um, he took a job at GE in Cincinnati. So we were down there, but he was like working full time at GE and then also flying at the guard in Toledo. So he was like going back and forth all the time. So that was, he was never really home a lot, anyways, then. So um, yeah, I don't know. it's kind of interesting because even after he left like the military, he's still been like. 
going into time and traveling uh, to work, so um, that's a, that's a shift there. But yeah, he eventually left the Toledo Guard and was stationed at Michigan Guard, which is when here, um, and as a student, and then he got, he was going to get deployed, but he ended up getting transferred to teach at Nellis. Mm -hmm. um, so he got certified on the F-35 and was um, been teaching Nellis for a couple of years, and then now he's there. Wow. Next. Um, so I was a little, little fortunate with the move, at least in my lifetime, because <coughs> I was born in 1998, and that's when my dad um, retired from active duty. He went to the Navy Reserve, so he only had to do one weekend a month in uh, Groton, Connecticut, where he did the drilling. Um, in 2006, uh, he was recalled to Kuwait, so that was, I think, I'm, I'm the middle child, I have an older brother, younger sister, all three of us were in elementary school. Um, so he missed uh, the third part of, I think it was, he was gone for about nine, nine, ten months. And um, then in 2012, he retired. So I'm in a little bit of a similar, similar situation where my older brother was born in uh, by Hampton, Virginia, where my dad was first stationed. And then I was born in Charleston, South Carolina. And then my sister was born in upstate New York, where we were moved to. So <laughs> we're both in uh, different, different situations. but. Um, I was fortunate enough where I could spend the majority of, of my uh, childhood in one in one spot, so that was that was good. But the uh, the um, let's see, uh, just I guess more about my dad. He was on the he did submarines. He's a nuclear engineer from the Naval Academy on the USS Newport News. But then he got deployed to the to the desert in Kuwait, so that was kind of interesting. <laughs> but um, yeah, so that's that's. And my, my yeah. <coughs> yeah. For myself, uh, so what was really interesting was uh, when I got out of the military is uh, when I started going to school to college again. I uh, was I switched to four different universities, not each year but each semester. I would switch to a new university, mm -hmm. and I, I think it was just from the military. And I would, I'm talking about major changes because I was going from. California to Florida to Michigan, I was doing massive moves and uh, and I kind of had to look at it like, what am I doing? But I was just so used to that lifestyle. And what's interesting is last night I was listening to a bunch of podcasts and stuff that were about veteran suicide. And one of the, they were trying to speculate why their numbers so bad. And they, they were saying a combination of extreme social isolation, isolation that happens with that and also this chronic detachment. When you, when you move like that, it's I do become misspelled last name and incorrect first name. And there's been times where I don't even correct people because I know I'm leaving. So they start calling me Robert. And I'm like, screw it, I'm Robert, you know, <laughs> because I'm not staying here. And that, that's a problem because then I, I don't get to know who you really are. You don't know my name, so I don't get to connect with you. So, and that happens at the VA now when I go for a PTSD counselor. Mm -hmm. They still miss my name. They don't get it right. And it does so much, I quit. I'm like, okay, then I'm that person. We are pretending and this is not me. So when we're talking about this, this is an issue for, for people to come out. And now we have to get into civilian work and we just don't know how to not move and connect with people, especially for those individuals who serve in combat, especially for people with PTSD. So if there's people listening right now and you're struggling with these issues, because this is a bad time too. The Veterans Day yesterday was brutal. For me. That was a brutal day for me. Now we got Thanksgiving. Again, I move so much. I'm alone on Thanksgiving. I'm not going to be with anybody on that day. Christmas is coming up. I'm going to be alone on Christmas. So these these holidays, these, I understand completely why veterans kill themselves. And it is that that level of isolation and that chronic attachment. So I just wanted to like kind of segue into that from what we're yeah, talking about. Yeah. I think it's a good segue too. Of uh, kind of what I mean, as we talked about this moves and everything, what it you know. It's easy to mark dates, right? And say, they did, they did, they did. But how does that, I mean, for some things it strengthens it, sometimes it, it weakens it. I mean, you know, the war trade is high amongst, you know, army and especially uh, military when they're deploying that in the surge. Um, I, 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 I read an account that was about 80% divorce rate um, in the army 2010, 2011, 2012. So how does, how does that, 
impact family dynamics from you guys, from you as a spouse, from you as, as children? Um, and I realize your spouse is there too. So, but, but I think, to, I mean, to you know, talk about like, how does that change it? How do you, do you and then how's it different than folks maybe looking at the, you know, traditional life? I, I come home, I go to work, I come home. Um, and how do you adapt to that too? Like, how is that adaptation to, to make that work? It's such a huge question. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's almost overwhelming. It's like as you're talking, like just the things just keep popping up. I mean, there, it's it's such a huge issue. And even when I just saw the scope of the questions, I was just like, how much time are they going to be having us talk? Because I mean, this has been my whole life. This has been my whole life. And and it's um, there's there's just so many different aspects to it. Um, the the moving. Um, I think a big part of it that popped up, um, but, but, you know, speaking and, and what you're asking is um, is that when you move that consistency, trying to, to find some sort of consistency when there really isn't any. So you can blame a lot of things on, well, this move, things aren't okay because of this move, or well, he's gone for two weeks, it'll be better, you know, when he comes back, and you know, or we'll, we'll figure this out the next time we move, and. You know, we're busy unpacking these boxes. And as soon as you unpack the last box, it's time to start figuring out how you can pack the boxes again for the next move, which things do you not need anymore because the kids are at the next age. You know, um, having your kids understand that it's a good time to get rid of things we're moving, right? So they are, you know, and then realizing, oh, maybe you can't do that anymore. You have to take everything with you every time because that's all they have is what they're bringing with them. Um, so, yeah, I mean, all of that plays into that idea of consistency and being able to, um, not being able to observe things that I think um, many families who have that one home, one school, one set of friends uh, in a family support group, they're able to observe things in family dynamics and maybe address those family dynamics in a way that a military family is too busy addressing life <laughs> with the move and the aspects of military life to address maybe um themselves and just you know that uh, people have challenges anyway and so just addressing that um military families are just families like anyone else and and those those issues sometimes get set on the back burner because just the m m massive you know Like you're juggling a lot. I mean, to use a metaphor, right? Constantly. Like you're constantly juggling. You only have two hands, right? So. Right, and and you don't know what you know. No one, there is a handbook, <laughs> but it doesn't tell you how to prioritize things. Yeah. Um, you know, it's to, to say that um, the army cares about family. The army is an organization. It doesn't care, right? I mean, there are systems in place. To help each other care for each other and just to build that in. But the army is not basic. Organizations don't have the same capacity um, to prioritize that in that way. To, you know, for people to take care. And, and that's, I think that's an overall cultural thing we have anyway. But it is definitely a dynamic that is exaggerated in the military, if not. not Taking care of yourself um, when there's so many other things that need to be taken care of. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, so my youngest two siblings are like now 10 and 12. 
Um, but for like the majority of their childhood, we've been, um, we moved back to my parents' hometown because they were in high school. So we ended up moving back there to our family um, after we left Cincinnati. And so the younger two have like been there pretty much like their entire lives, which at least for as long as they've been in school. And then like the older four of us have been like moving or like at least, um, like my brother, the youngest one of the older four is like a little too young to quite remember like all the moves, but like there was still like a lot of disruption going on and we still were bouncing around a lot. And like I moved to school like a lot of times. Um, so just like comparing like the, I guess the like just a lot of like personality wise and like just like perspective on life, even as like younger kids that the youngest two have compared to like the older four of us is like really interesting to me because it's like, okay, well you guys have like stayed in one place and had grandmas and grandpas around like your whole lives versus like the older four of us have been like, for a while it was like just us four and like mom and dad, you know, like we, it was hard to make friends because like they're moving all the time. So it was like, you know, we have this like little family unit. Which I think you're talking about like the struggles and stuff a lot, which obviously there are a lot, but like I also think it's like interesting with like okay, like to you and your family against like the world and why aren't you guys do it by yourself other than like the squadron? But um yeah, I don't know, I guess that's my perspective is like obviously they have the same genetics as we do, <laughs> but they're just like completely different. Like you're talking about like packing stuff up and like moving boxes and stuff. And um, I was trying to get my little sister, I'm like, you know, you should get rid of some of this stuff, you don't want to play with it anymore. And she's like, no, like, I have to hold on to it. I'm like, you know, purge. Like, <laughs> clearly you haven't moved 13 times, and it shows. <laughs> but, yeah, I guess that's my take. Yeah, I, I got a chance to talk to my brother and my dad yesterday about some of the stuff uh, for, this, for this panel. And um, I remember uh, we... Uh, we were in a, a small town, and um, when when my dad got recalled in 2006, uh, it was it was kind of a foreign concept. Like it wasn't something that a lot of people in the class or in the school had like heard of or like been through before. He was, my dad was telling me yesterday that, that him and my mom went to like our teachers and everything, were like explaining like, okay, he's going to be gone. You know, this, this is what's going to go on and how it's going to affect the students and, and like. Uh, us as, as the children and like you know they were like you know totally totally it was totally bizarre to them like that hadn't happened in that community that often and um uh it actually it, my brother had, had some difficulty with that from like understanding with teachers and and i was probably a little young um so i i uh you know was was, was protected from a lot of the, the effects of that but um I remember my dad was, was telling me when when he got back uh, from the Middle East and uh, he like flew into Albany, you know, they, they have like a lot of, um, you know, you see on TV like veterans come home and stuff and like he was in his, he was in Desert Samuel and they still like patted him down and everything like there was like no big welcome or like anything like that because, you know, we weren't going to a, a place, I don't, I don't know, and that and it speaks to another issue where where we weren't really connected with a lot of other military people i'd say i know that um you know that could be like a misconception where like oh like your military buddies and like you have like all these military families together and like that's your community and stuff but like in our situation where we were like we didn't have that kind of community so um you know that that also kind of speaks to where we were in geographically almost but um yeah so that that was um really really kind of strange for for people in our community to tell them oh yeah like this is what what's going on and then um you know i uh i was able to, to talk to them about that yesterday so that was good <laughs> just remember uh i'm just taking the line because people are asking remember to kind of talk as loud as you can for the, the microphones especially this one so yeah uh, let me see. I'll get closer to Jeff. The other ones are going to my head, but I want to respect those too. Um, um, what's the, so what's the best part um, of uh, military family life? What do you think the best part is? It's going to delve into some harder stuff. What do, what do you like about it? Is there, are, are there things that you like? You don't have to, you know, it's a, it's a stretch that we're the 80 adults, that's fine. 
But, you know, is there a good part that you, when you look back, say, oh, there's a, there's a cool part. Um, definitely uh, seeing the world and then having that um, different worldview, even if the world is, you know, not overseas, it, you know, just being out of your own little world, wherever you came from. Um, I think just getting out and meeting people from different parts of the country, different parts of the world, um, and then also those communities that are built um, in the places where you have that community, like they said, that's not always something that you have, but um, in the places where you do have it, um, it can be extremely strong. Um, I, I feel like um, our community up in Alaska, because it was so, we were in Fairbanks, it's very remote. Um, that's, I mean, the community support systems there were very strong because people had no one else. I mean, people were really remote and there's there's not much else to do. I mean, the times that I was in Germany, I mean, it's remote, but there's so much to do. People are out doing things. And in Alaska, you know, you just really needed, you needed that uh, support system. And so, um, under, you know, knowing that everyone from everywhere could come and with a, a somewhat similar mission, so, you know, so to speak, and also to, to be there for each other. When I landed in uh, Fairbanks, my husband was still deployed and, um, you know, there were other spouses and family there with, you know, little signs and cookies and, you know, even though I had to stay in the hotel for with the kids for two months or something, um, you know, they were there to welcome us. And uh, so, and then just, you know, that, that ability to, to look and then also the, my kids are really close. You know, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's one side of a two sided point, mm -hmm. you know, and that, you know, leaving all those con good connections is difficult and being someplace where there aren't those connections is difficult. Being in a community that doesn't have a lot of military families is challenging, especially because there's so much benefit and positivity in those situations when you have them. Um, but they're fleeting, it's only for a couple of years. And, um, and then so with the kids, you know, there's a lot of challenge to, to leaving and moving and um, changing schools, but my kids, they feel, I mean, they're pretty close in age, but they're, they're also very close. And as much as they are siblings and don't always get along and harass each other, they um, they really are close. And I think that we will always take care of each other. Um, they are their best friends, you know? And I, and I try to um, always tell them like, this is the person you're always gonna have. You know, and I think all families try to tell their kids that, but there's just that different aspect of um, getting up and moving and traveling and spending that, all that time in a car together. And um, they just are close. And that's a huge, for me, that's a huge benefit to them to be that close. I don't want to share it. Uh, uh, almost 14 and almost. Let's talk to this thing. You mentioned Italy? Yeah, yeah, twice, right? Yeah, I mean, um, we were there for a year, so I started school there. And, um, yeah, it was a cool. I wish I was older and familiar there because I was like, like three to six. But I mean, I remember, but it's not like, I don't know, equipment goals. It was like, I'm like, they're actually stupid with the language and stuff. But um, yeah, I guess like moving <clears throat> different places is definitely a plus. I mean, for as much as it sucks to like have to paint all the time, it's nice to see the things and um, be around things like that. I like to see the I guess. Anyway, I guess like I saw a lot of different schools, a lot of different people, you know, just like being in different parts of the country um, in school. Um, I think the, the closeness thing with the siblings is like, for me, looking back now, um, like my siblings are like my best friends, you know what I mean? Like, school always be really close, especially like the older ones of us, because it's just like we went through a lot of stuff together, especially like my, um, the, the next sister, her and I, like, you know, we, we do support each other a lot, you know, like we take care of each other, and it's like, I don't know, it's just special and fun. Um, I guess any other thing too is uh, like the relationships you build and like the military and the squadron and stuff, because like um, a lot of, like a lot of people my dad met in like Italy, like 
uh, almost like over 15 years ago now. They're like still people he keeps in contact with and um, still like have a like, close relationship there. So just like having that sit on this. I think for me, some of some the cool stuff. Well, I asked my dad this question, and he said, you know, talk about sense of accomplishment and camaraderie and, and everything. But, but from my perspective, I think, you know, um, there's just a lot of cool stuff that you get exposed to. You get to see, like, a couple of times we go to the, the, the naval base with him, or, or like, you know, and see, see cool stuff that, you know, my friends or like other people didn't get to see. And, um, you know, uh, watching like submarine movies with my friend, and then I call up my dad and like ask him about like, oh, what was that really like? You know, so get the inside scoop on a lot of stuff. So, so that's that's cool. <laughs> and um, having a, a dad that does something cool and, and like that that you can like, you know, talk about and and um, I don't I don't know. Uh, <laughs> it's, I'm proud of him, and uh, you know that that's been that's been inspirational for me. I'm going to respond to this, but I want to be pretty honest. Um, so when I was in boot camp, the big shock for me that was a revelation was the first time I realized that there is somebody in the face. Uh, and I remember when that happened, I went, oh, this is real. Like, I didn't know they could hit us. Um, and then when I went to A school, we had a recruit get killed right at the gate. And we were at the gate when he was famous. Um, so when I realized they could kill us in training too, I was on hyper alert. So by the time Devin Storm rolled around, we had double digit people getting killed. That's what I look back on the military. It's hard for me when somebody asks me what's your favorite thing about the military. If you serve during the war, your mind goes there immediately. And that's a, a fun time. So for me to respond with something fun is a mistake because I get the money that they do. So it's not the best response. I want to think of this particularly too, again. Uh, you know, uh, I think all of you talked about deployment. Right? You're deployed at some point in time and went across the country with it. And, you know, even flying a jet and training, you know, especially training, especially evaluation, is, is difficult because you don't know things can happen. So um, I think part of that, you know, people don't understand always the, the worry aspect, especially in deployment. Especially when it's so constant that um, when you can't, they don't come home. You can hug them at night, and they don't, you know, hi dad, welcome home. Or, hi mom, welcome home. You know, there's different, you know, I guess different thing of dread and okay, what's going on? How are they doing? Kind of stuff. Can you talk about that kind of what that does or, or how that affects you or your family? Uh, kind of worrying about this job that they do is this dangerous. Um, I guess no. So um, I guess I deployed a second few times. I guess like the big one was the Iraq deployment in like I think oh eight maybe. Um, and he was gone for like an extended period of time. And I leading, I knew he was gonna leave, but I think his like date got pushed up for whatever reason. So it kind of like just brought on us a little bit. But um, I don't know. I guess I just I I looking back on that, I didn't really talk to anyone about it because I don't know. I was the oldest. I thought I had to like kind of just face it, but um, he flew out and we like got to watch him take off or whatever. And then um, I remember just like going to the parking lot <laughs> and I went to get in the car and I just like puked in the parking lot just because I had like so much like worry and like everything pan out for so long. And it was just finally like, <laughs> okay, like you got to get this out. But um, I guess I, that is like a very vivid note for me because I'm like, okay, like when I look back, I'm like, obviously I was worried and stuff, but like it doesn't really. Strike me as much as like that one moment where I was like, okay, clearly there's a lot going on here. Um, and then when I was older, like he was deployed again, he was in uh, Djibouti for a while, then he was in Jordan, um, which that was only like three months, and I was like older, so I was like, okay, like um, it didn't seem as long because I had a lot going on with like school and stuff, but it's just like, I don't, it was better then because like we had Skype back in the day, but it wasn't like we could Skype all the time and it was like very blurry and stuff. And like, but then with the other deployment when I was like older, it was like, okay, like we could actually talk to them more frequently. It's like, so it's like less of a panic of like what's going to happen. Um, I, I guess <laughs> I always have this like false sense of confidence that like he would be, always be fine. You know what I mean? It didn't really cross my mind that frequently, like, oh, like, you know, 
he gets scratched and it's more for like something could happen. Um, but I don't know. It, later, he was like, my mom was, was telling us um, that someone he used to fly with like went down and like died. And that, that kind of hit me. So I'm like, wow, like that could have happened at any point. So um, yeah, that kind of thing. And kind of like what we were talking with, um, he also had a friend that committed suicide like a few years ago. And that one also got me too because I was like, you know, like this isn't just like, it was done, it was then and done. It's like, he's got a lot of stuff that he has to deal with for like the rest of his life. And um, he's like better about talking about stuff now, but he's still like, you know, 20 years of service and like multiple deployments and stuff. And he does not really like, talk about it. Like I'm sure there's like 20 different things that he needs to like get out. But um, yeah, I guess like that's when I like belong to it. It's uh, like dealing with that for the rest of his life. One reason I come is that you were talking about the learning to talk to the more of the better process to have to help it is going to let force themselves to do it. Because I, I, don't, I don't like some of these things. Like yesterday, going through lunch, I said, it's, it's too bad. That's too intense for me. I have that many bets in one of them altogether. I, I can't do that. So, but I force myself to do it because it's healing to do it. It's easy what we're doing right now to connect with other people because it's so good for What's your name? What's your last name? What's your last name? I don't know. I'm just um, part of that deployment. I, I'm just thinking back. We had a uh, right before my dad left, we uh, we bought a uh, a video camera, and I think it was the first one of the first video cameras I ever used as a kid. And we would make these little these little uh, mini DVDs of like all the stuff. And like recently, we were we were just like looking back through those. And, Thinking back, like, why do we do all this? Why? And then I realized, like, oh, yeah, like, we would send these all, and then he, we sent them all, and then he actually brought them all back. That's why we still have, I don't even think we had copies. We just like send them everything, everything we could. And then, yeah, no, so like, I, I, you know, there's like the aspect of like how much do you do, does like my dad talk about, like, how much do you share? Like, there's definitely a lot of his experiences that, like, you know, he, he's still dealing with, like, like he said, for the, for the rest of his life and a lot of stuff. So, like, I only have a certain perspective on that. So, um, you know, and I really, you know, from, from a kid's perspective, you know, you, you don't, you know, there's a lot that you don't tell your kids and there's a lot, you know, that kids get shielded from. So, uh, you know, um, I, I think it is good to talk about, about these, uh, these issues and, and to share things with them. Yeah, so you know, protecting kids, you know. Uh, I think there's a there's a, one of the things you have to be careful about is that, like every family, every individual is gonna respond differently. So you know, I have friends that were just like on the verge of tears every moment when their husbands are gone, um, and then there's um, other people that just handle it differently and not say better, just differently, and. Um, you know, I think each deployment is different and circumstances are different. Um, my hardest one was probably when um, our son, my first born was born and, and Jason left uh, two weeks later and then he ended up getting extended. Um, so it was, you know, he came home, he left with a you know, two week old and came home to a toddler. Um, and uh, <laughs> there's more to that too, but I mean, um, so that one was really challenging to the emotional the emotions involved and you know hormones involved and in, of having a newborn and everything but um you know there are things that for me personally is my coping is um no news i don't watch the news i still don't really watch the news that much i figure i mean it's gonna get to me somehow if it's important um and just kind of Charging on with life and focusing on um, what you can, mm -hmm. and um, that can get you through the day because um, that's personally the way I deal with things. Um, you know, but you know, I, it, it's interesting to think of how my uh, how my kids probably think of it because they definitely go through their own things, and you don't know when that is happening, and um, so that's a challenge too because out of nowhere something will just pop up and you're not ready for it. Um, during one of the deployments, my son had started kindergarten and 
we weren't in a military community. And so, you know, I, mean, I was volunteering in this classroom quite a bit. And we thought, well, we'll do a veterans day, you know, activity and talk about it a little bit. And, um, but then it just, it brought up things that he hadn't thought about as a kindergartner. And all of a sudden he was very upset you know, and he was very worried. So um, just, you know, those things come out of nowhere at you sometimes. You know, you think you're, you're doing good, you're on track, <laughs> and then um, and then all of a sudden something will just come up and be like, thank you. Um, and so, you know, it's just, it's, it's an adventure. There's no, like, one way to experience it, you know, like all of us have had very different experiences, and even within a family. I'm sure that my kids, each one of them would have their own version to tell. Thank you. Um, we talked about that. What do you think are what what, are, what is uh, a common misconception you think people have about military families and life? Um, how does it impact you, and how can we compact these misconceptions? Maybe what what what's one misconception you think people have about being a military spouse, being a military dad, being in the military? I don't know if this necessarily is a misconception, but I think a lot of people will be like, I don't know. Like when you're first a new kid, you're like, oh, like, well, you know, my dad's in the Air Force, blah, blah, blah. Like, give him the whole intro. They like have this like idea that, like, oh, it's so cool to move around all the time and like stuff like that. But, or they'll be like, oh, wow, I could never move all the time. But they don't, like, I mean, obviously you can't understand things unless you like experience them, but they just have no idea what it's like actually like to like. Do that on a regular basis or that be your life like it's not like it's just like you go through this little phase where it's like oh yeah we moved ha fun it's like the entire like foundation of like who i am as a person and like how i grew up it was moving all the time so it's like taking that and like comparing it to like someone else's perspective or like how they grew up is just like i don't want to say it's like yeah like not a misconception but they just like cannot like like wrap their head around what that actually is like so i think that's the thing for me it's like actually like truly Understanding what that is like, uh, it's just like, yeah, I guess. I think uh, one of the things is that people misunderstand, um, they undervalue the experience that. The, then that undervalues the experience that family members, you know, spouses, and, and even as a kid can bring to a situation. Um, I think it's so much revolved around, I, I could be wrong, I don't know if there's something who actually thinks, but I get the feeling that a lot of people think, oh, you've been following your husband around from place to place, supporting his career, and, um, and there, I mean, there's an element to that, but um, along the way, I feel like um, I have a lot of skills and um, that I've picked up here and there. They're not things I've got at a university. Um, that I have some random, you know, papers that the military gave me saying that I took this class and did that, but they don't really um, say how you have learned to connect with new people and organize things in a way that is supportive to people and, um, you know, just to the ability to jump into new situations and, and because you only have three years <laughs> to do whatever you're going to do. So you might as well just jump in and do it. And, um, that those, that those are skills and those are valuable skills. And then also that you're your own person and that you came with your own set of skills before you even married into the military. And, um, you know, that those, even though you've been doing all this other stuff, but you still have those, those skills, that set of skills, that, that ability. Um, and, you know, I, I think a lot of times, I don't know, people are just afraid to ask questions about what it's like, like to be um, a military family, but it's always, everything's always about the, the military number, you know? And so it's just always like, um, you know, well, thank you for your service. Well, I know I don't, I know some of the military guys 
get tired of doing that. But I mean, I get tired of doing it too, because I've done that. Just it just ends the conversation. Mm -hmm. Like they don't aren't asking who I am or or what I do or you know like that's just I that's who I am. I'm just you know I'm supporting my husband. You know, so that that can be challenging, and I, I think that the misconception that I feel whether it's an actual reality how people look or if they just don't understand how to reach out to most they yeah, in a more meaningful way. There's some really enjoyable pictures of the speakers that all of this that doc was no fault of my own. My, my biggest misconception I feel from the public is having no conception whatsoever, just no interest, no knowledge. If, if you looked, I'm in the MSW program, and, it, and if you looked at like minority groups, veterans have higher alcoholism rates, suicide rates, homelessness rates, incarceration rates, deadly police shooting rates. And so we can keep going for some reason. It's never mentioned. Vets are never mentioned in my program ever. And yet, the interesting thing about this is that people say, well, well, who do you want to work with? I want to work with homeless. I want to work with elderly people. One third of your male veterans, or, or of your uh, like the homeless population for male is your male veterans. And you know, the study it showed like uh, uh, people 75 years and older, uh, about 45 percent of them are veterans. So many people serve like that. 65, uh, 65 and older, 33 percent, about a quarter third are your veterans. So they're saying, oh, I, I, there's no interest in veterans to then say, what do you want to do? I want to work with homeless population. I want to work with older people. Well, those are veterans. You need to understand how to work to, to the, the whole mindset of veterans and they have no conception at all and do thank you for your service if that with no follow-up ever about me no interest in me um and i think it's just it's such a different world that it, it's too hard to talk about somebody with four they don't even know where to begin and if it is it's a terrible question like this have you ever killed anybody like and then coming out of nowhere is so incredibly disrespectful so it's either high disrespect with, but mostly it's just nothing, no conception, no interest at all. And that's hard. And, the, and one of the, the, the things that I've been reading about and listening to about with this that suicide is because of that, because there is no, I feel like there's no caring at all from, from the service of being with at all. So that means that all this weight on veterans, we have to do this ourselves, we have to connect ourselves. And we already are going through PTSD, but we also have to be, be doing that as well. It's really complicated, really hard. Especially because the VA can be so bad, you know. <laughs> and that, you know, and that reaches over onto the family too, right? There's a family worried about a service member, and um, and the service member is worried about their buddies, mm -hmm. you know. And then every time there's that happens, then the family is worried about the service member, you know. Like it's a ripple effect, you know, um, too. That is an odd. It's an, another layer of stress, you know. That the service member and the family go through. But um, weird question. So I forget what you written down. So then you had it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask it. Um, is there a time that you wish your that your family had done something differently? Um, if you do it all over over each other, like I think that's better part. Like if you do, you, you mentioned about juggling and not juggling something. Is there a specific instance? What, if I could go back and change that part, I would change it. Um, relating to, you know, being a military family member. That's a hard question. I don't think there's any one thing because you make decisions at a time based on information you have, and I don't know that we can go back and um, change a certain situation. But I think overall. Um, I think that I wish all of us as a family um, had been less concerned with meeting expectations. You know, there's a lot of expectations in the military culture um, and been a little more concerned with um, being a family, you know, which we were, but you know, like you also want to be the right kind, you know, like you want to be the right family, <laughs> not okay. compared to other people, but just doing the right thing. I mean, there, I think, and maybe it's my generation too, it's the same way with, with when you're having kids and there's just the internet and there's just a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. And um, that's amplified just even more in the military as well. There's a right 
right way. As much as you might say, you know, we want spouses to do their own thing and kids to be, you know, kids. Um, there's just a specific culture and there's expectations and um, they're not written down, but they're there. And so it gets, you get wrapped up into them very easily. And so I think um, if we had taken them with a little more grain of salt along the way, um, it probably would have been healthier. There is that real quick. It's a, it's a, it's a, good, a good part of that that I don't think people understand. But there are, uh, uh, when you talk about, you know, the officer enlisted, you know, the who was, you know, I, I heard when I was in, and this has changed a really long ago, but I suspect it hasn't, you know, the, the, the spouse makes, helps make the officer's career. So there's some kind of, there's expectations of the social aspect of what the spouse is expected to do in this kind of culture. And there is a, like a call, it, the term came to my head when you talk about like a Stepford family for military. Like there, there's this, uh, expe like this expectation of what it's supposed to look like. Is that true? I mean, yeah, well, and, and you know, the whole way along, they're saying no. Just, you know, you come in and they say no. That's, you know, that's not a thing. But it is. <laughs> you know, it is. It, it's just tradition. There's a lot of tradition in the military. And so it's there. And, um, and you're also, so the times that you're living on a military post or base, you know, um, everyone around you works with your husband. Like, everyone works with they drive, you know, so you have to see where your boss is going down the road. You know, like, you know, you live in that community. There's that all the, the whole community revolves around their work schedule. When my husband's gone, their husband's gone. Like, it's just, um, it's not real life. <laughs> it's really weird. And so, and, and there's a structure that's built in to, you know, provide support. But, you know, we're people and people confuse support with hierarchy. <laughs> and so there's some weird, there are weird, difficult challenges in, those communities, just like in any community, but it's just, you know, really intense. And, um, and, and yeah, and so I think it gets really confused with expectations. You're not in your head, so that's what I'm going on. Oh, I was uh, <laughs> um, I, know, I was thinking more of like, there were like a couple, two specific moments where I was like, okay, looking back, I'm like, what if we did that? Because it's like, um, well, my dad, I was talking to him last night. He's like, you know, if I were to do it all over again, I don't know if I would have uh, got out, gotten out of active duty when I did, because it was like, he's like, oh, I wouldn't have had much more left, like, I would have done. But um, he said, like, his reasoning was like, he wanted me to have like, stability in school and stuff. So that's why. But um, there was, well, this was actually not military roads, but there was a, a point in time when we were in Cincinnati and he was, um, he was still planning to be barred, but he could have been done. And, he had an opportunity to go to Poland for um, PE. And I'm like looking back, I'm like, you know what? Like the trajectory would have been so different if we did that versus like going back to my parents' hometown. It's just like interesting because it's like these like decisions you look back on, they're like huge decisions. And it's like, okay, like what would have what would have been different about the family now if like you would have done that? And again, it happened in like maybe 2018. There was like an opportunity for everybody to relocate to Vegas from my dad's in Ellis. And it was like Okay, like what would have been different if that would have happened, you know? Um, so I guess that's just like, I, the thing for me is like looking on the decisions and then like, it's just now it picks up, um, like as I'm looking to like, what, where do I want to live? Or like, what do I want to do with my life? It's like, well, you could move and do this or like go wherever, but like, do you want to? <laughs> like, you don't have to, but <laughs> yes, you could do it. Yes, you could adapt. Yes, you could like, make friends or like just change your life drastically. But <laughs> do you want to do that again? I don't know. It's just like kind of funny. I guess. All right. Are you thinking about that as you, as you're proposed to you because you're younger and thinking about your life, like after, are you, are you like, I still want to do, you, you feel like that kind of wonder lost of the, I, you know, I have to go out and do, I have this move, I have this new thing. Or are you <laughs> like, like, I just want a home and I just want to stay there. I don't want to find a garden. I don't want to just yeah. live. Like what, or is it somewhere in between? But I mean, does this, this affects you, but how do you yeah. think it affects you? Well, like a year ago, she would ask me this. I've been like, no, I, I want to go. I'm so anxious. Like, I'm very, like, I just like, 
like you were talking like every semester you change colleges like that was me like my third second or third year i was like what if i just transfer <laughs> and like why <laughs> just because i'm like used to it, i just like wanted to go like i'm like i just wanted to move but um i don't know now i'm more like oh you know it would be nice to just have one place to just be and like not have to like uproot all the time but i don't know who knows what i'll do <laughs> i'll let you know in six months <laughs> Yeah, I think my, my family had like a little bit of a similar crossroads where my dad had a choice. I asked him if he would have done anything differently. And it's, you know, he didn't have that many choices. <laughs> he, I don't know, but um, one choice that we had, he had to choose the, between South Carolina, where I where we did choose, where I was born, and then his other option was Guam. And like, we were just thinking, like, how our entire lives were just been completely different. If I had been born and grew up in Guam instead of South Carolina and then New York, so like, yeah, no, like it is interesting to think about, like, you know, <laughs> you you face these like decisions on like a regular basis of like, you know, where is it and then geography, like where you are, that impacts you a lot, and then like how long you're there, who you meet, you know, all those experiences and everything. Well, it's a completely different trajectory. So um, yeah, and then you know that's kind of playing into how I'm like choosing to. To do so now and, and like i am kind of somewhere in the middle where i'm you know i want to see uh, a lot of places and there's a lot of things i haven't seen so you know i i am kind of exploring a little bit so yeah i think there's an underdeveloped skill of, of knowing how to say um and we're just broaching that now and um and it it is hard because i think part of it i've been thinking about it a lot lately it, Part of it is that you get used to, well, we're going to have to just leave this because the Army told us to. Um, well, we're going to move here because the Army told us to. And so there's a lot of decision making that you have to start making um, that you really haven't made. You know, you, you your worldview is open, so you see how many possibilities there are. But um, You've never had to make a decision of where to go and where to stay and what, I mean, early, even, you know, hardly where to live and what school. Those are all things that just, have, they just fall into place under a really tight time plan. So to have to start making those decisions is a very new skill and um, a little overwhelming at first to think, um, to think, you know, I can go anywhere and do anything <laughs> whenever I want, <laughs> you know? What exactly do I want to do? Yeah, it's a new. You know, used to if you're used to three choices at a restaurant, and suddenly you go to a place that has like fifty, mm -hmm. you're kind of like, well, what am I? Oh, mm -hmm. What am I? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, the rest real quick, since you touched on, I haven't thought of this really, uh, and I want to explore it a little bit if you don't mind. Um, living, did you, did all of you live on base? Oh, did you ever live on base? Like uh, on base, on base? Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think before I was born, my family lived on base. Okay. But then once I was born, I think uh, we moved to yeah. But you two, you two, you guys said, like, what was, how, what, what was that like living in? I mean, I lived on base when I was doing it, but I didn't have family. Um, but for family, always, what's that like? Living where you were, living where it's kind of like a fishbowl, right? Like, 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 how has that changed? Kind of like, you know, if you kids could get trouble, well, kids do stuff, but when you're living like where dad works, there's some different pressures involved with that. We had one when we first moved to Alaska, and I didn't know who anyone was, I didn't know who any of the kids belonged to yet. And some kid hit my kid on the playground, I marched that kid. <laughs> mom, where is your mom's house? You know, and uh, it was my husband's boss, you know. <laughs> so, uh, you know, my boss's boss. the boss's boss. <laughs> so, you know, and you're talking about some of those social and expectations, you know, um, and then you have the kids and parenting, and you know, I just moved in and I, you know, it wasn't okay for this kid to hit my kid. But then if I had known who kid it was, I might have gone about it in a different way. I don't know. It's just, there is a lot, it's complicated. <laughs> and, um, you know, you don't do anything perfect, just like anything else, you know. Um, you do what you think is right at the time, it's not always the right thing. But, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's unusual, it's hard. 
you know, but at the same time, you got the, like, I think the kids had, everyone was experiencing the same thing. So I think it's more supportive for, for the kids um, when their parents are doing things. Not always that they're all with military kids. When we were in Kansas, they were in a school that was all military kids, but the parents were all doing different things and they were only there for one year and it wasn't a positive experience, but I think um, in Alaska, it was a positive experience, but they knew all the other, all the other kids were going through the same experiences. They had a lot in common. Do children feel like growing up, like pressure for, like, don't, don't do anything bad or don't like behave yourself because there's additional pressures there, there's additional thing of like, don't make this look bad. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. I, I guess when we lived on base, it was like maybe for like two years, a year and a half. I don't know. Maybe like nine months. It's hard to like, I think it was like nine months, maybe. Um, or like at least I was at the school for like nine months. Um, but the school wasn't even like all military kids. It was like this weird, like, I don't know what the situation was exactly, but there were like kids that were like not military. I don't like, so I don't know why they were there, but it was like the school was like on base, but also like had an entrance off base. I don't know. But there were like a couple of kids that were military, which is like an experience that I never had before. And that was really cool because it was like, okay, like these guys get it, you know? And, and then we could like hang out, like, and we were all like right here. So we'd go to like hang out usually um, after school, out of school. But um, I guess during that time, my dad was like gone most of the time that he was at Weber School. So it wasn't, there was never like a thing of like, oh, you know, like dad's working and then we're also like living right here with dad and his work. It was like, he was on, we were there. Um, but I don't know, I guess as far as expectations, I don't know. I guess as far as like my, like just my parents were pretty strict, um, especially on me because I was a bit older, but I don't think, I don't want to say it has anything to do with the military. I think it's just how my parents kind of are. Um, and my dad's pretty like, He's pretty um, military, like style, I guess, of parenting. He's very, um, I don't want to say rigid. I don't, he's very, he's, he's got a very like military mind. So the way he like thinks about things is like that. So I guess um, he like holds himself to a higher standard just like being around him. He's, he's such a like smart guy. He's got his like very like particular. So, um, but other than that, no, I don't, I didn't feel, especially because I feel like that I'm in this squadron at least, a lot of the kids were younger than me. Like, so I was like, what am I going to compare myself to a five-year-old? You know what I mean? <laughs> there's like no expectation because there's no way to compare. So, um, yeah, I guess that's my experience. So, you get down to the bottom of the question. Um, what would you get? What piece of practical advice would you give? I mean, I hope you can say stuff, but what piece of practical advice would you give to somebody starting out as a, as a military family? Uh, and child of a military member, if you could go and talk to yourself earlier. Just starting out, you know, getting married and and your husband or wife is going to the military, or, or you, you married a husband or a man or a man who's the yeah. end. What, what advice would you give them kind of at the start of the process? Yeah. Um, I guess I really hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that's where I wrote that to put on your own oxygen mask first. Like is I is that I think just like going into any marriage, you gotta understand, you know, what what you want to begin with, you know? But even more so in the military because you have to give up a lot of what you're doing and what you plan to do. Um do the location moves and um and then if you know if and when you have kids you're a single parent a lot you know so you have to really think those things through and i think really communicate um communicate your needs and your boundaries i think that's something that comes with time that could be maybe considered earlier um when I when I think of myself and my friends and you know it just it's so easy when you're not really being specific about your own goals and your own needs and your own time if you're not being specific about it and thinking about it on a regular basis it's easy to get tied up into the flow of everything else that is involved. So 
I was just being very mindful of yourself early on. Once you get to kids, as you go back, either talk to yourself or you met a five year old who is, uh, you know, my, my dad's in the military, my mom's in the military. What would you, uh, what advice would you give them if they could give advice? I have no idea, honestly. Like, I don't know. Like, I think part of the, um, part of the like character development and the growth process is to kind of figure it out. So, <laughs> We don't want to take that away from them. Um, but I don't know. I guess uh, just maybe like talking to more um, military kids or like um, just like because I think that's something that I wish I would have had when I was um, younger. Just like having someone to really do about it um, other than your sibling. Just like to be they know like an indicate situation. But yeah, I don't know. I think it's interesting because um, my sister is actually in Air Force RTC now. So she's going to be like, Having this like life in the military, I'm like, so clearly you didn't hate that much because you're going to do it again. But I don't know, I think it'll be interesting to watch it as well as she like plans her life and um, like has a family. Just if she decides to have a family, like how she would do things differently than she had growing up. So, yeah, I, I can definitely agree with that. Like seeking out more connections, um, it could be isolating. And I, I'd probably recommend just to not. Stay in isolation, just like seek out connections wherever you can for like other military people or other, um, you know, uh, within that within that sphere, people you can relate to, that sort of thing. Because I, you know, I, I can kind of like, I didn't have a lot of people I could like talk to growing up about about certain things. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So that that's probably what I would say. Just get seek out more connections within that. And also not be intimidated by the services that are available. Um, I think, you know, if you're going in with two of that idea of expectations, you know, um, there's a lot of intimidation and that idea of um, getting help for your kid. When you think of, you know, it's just the situation or um, the time, or I don't want them to end up on it. The SMP list, and then we can't go where my husband needs to go for his next um, career move. Um, you know, but just saying, you know, even if there's nothing wrong, it turns out that I'm overreacting to say it's, it's okay to, to, um, and to use the services that are there. I think help to eat skills always a uh... The big thing in the military is that can be expanded. I mean, uh, there's there's still some culture just around that mm -hmm. of uh, you know kind of do it your, do it yourself and tough enough kind of stuff you know uh, versus really what people need you know? and uh, you know saying that seeking help is strengthening you. Not it's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength. It's also strengthening you further when you do get help and seek help. Also, just getting another perspective yeah. on what's going on. So, as we close, uh, really, um, is there anything that we left out? Anything you want to share? Anything you think that our campus community should know about uh, family members uh, of service members? Whether are there students coming to school here who have but parents in the military or or spouses or partners that have uh, folks in the military that um, either sending their kids or coming themselves or work or colleagues you know what what do you think uh what do you think civilian population should know about uh military family we haven't covered um, i guess my thing is I think, like on this campus, a lot of people have like a negative perspective on the military, just like the, the things that the uh, United States military does, like overseas and stuff, um, which is like okay. But I think you can you can disagree with some of the things that the military does and still acknowledge uh, the service that people do and like the, the sacrifices that people have made. Um, so I guess like I guess that's just my thing of um, having an open mind 
like just because you might not uh, agree with like the military itself doesn't mean that like the challenges and the struggles and the um I guess development that happens uh being sent to the military uh, isn't like really um, also like, good or beneficial. Um yeah. Have you heard that have you heard that a lot on campus? Have you, have you, is it to make you feel like I, I can't I can't share my data? I guess like I just like I used to be um pretty like gone home military, pretty patriotic. Not that I'm not now, but it's um now I'm more like okay, like you know, there's a certain decisions that are made that I think aren't necessarily something that I would agree with personally, but I also still acknowledge that the military is a big part of my life, a big part of who I am. And um I think that I've gained a lot from being connected to the military and um I think there's like still like I don't know, I have like um I had a spinal fusion, so I can't like join. But if I didn't have that, I probably would be in the military now, you know. So it's like I don't know, I guess that's sometimes I'm like a little insecure, I guess, about like being like, oh yeah, you know, like I love the military. <laughs> because I don't want people to be like, oh my gosh, <laughs> this violent person. But <laughs> but yeah, I guess so I'm kind of like on the fence about it. I feel. I, I think when you come to a, a campus like this, where there um, might be a, a leaning a certain direction, it is it can be a little um, intimidating to come from living on a post or in communities where everyone is, you know, military. They're obviously supporting their family, <laughs> and um, and then to come somewhere where you feel like maybe people are looking at you differently, um, and for yeah, the same thing to to for people to acknowledge that um, military not only military members come from a wide variety across the country and don't have a single viewpoint on politics that um, their family members have even wider viewpoints. <laughs> um, they don't just all fall in line with their their husband or their wife commander. Like it's not like. Politics dictates how military families believe. That's not how it works. We're just Americans whose husbands decided to serve, and um, and we're supporting them the best we can, and also trying to be Americans who use the same process to drive politics that everyone else does. So, yeah. thank you. Absolutely. Any other follow up to that? All right, well, I thank you all very much for being here today and taking time out of your Friday uh, to join us and educate our community a little bit more about, about you um, and about your, your experiences. And um, hopefully they've gotten some stuff out of this and then we've learned a little bit more about this subject. Um, and I uh, thank everybody for joining us. I don't see any other, are there any other questions from the uh, folks still on the webcast? Um, if you have a question, please let me know. Uh, kind of last, I've kind of been following along the chat. As a thank you. Um, let's see the other. So um, I do thank you very much for your time today, and uh, good luck. All right, thanks a lot again, and thanks everybody for joining us. And that really concludes um, uh, our panel discussion.